Well, thank you all for coming. Good morning. Uh, my name is James Wilson. Uh, I'm work in the Office of the Historian at the State Department, uh, working on arms control and national security uh, policy volumes during uh, the, the Reagan and Bush administrations. Uh, we have here a very interesting panel. Uh, the title of our panel is Strategic Questions and Designs in the Reagan Era. And our first presenter will be uh, Kyle Balzer. Uh, I hope I'm doing an okay job of saying that name. Uh, Kyle received his PhD from the Ohio University. Uh, he is currently a postdoc at uh, the Clements Center in the University of Texas. Uh, Kyle is, or Dr. Balzer, is currently revising his dissertation into a book manuscript. Uh, the title is the revivalists James Schlesinger, the nuclear war fighting strategists, and uh, comparative strategy, competitive, sorry, <laughs> competitive strategies for long-term competition. And uh, a portion of that will be his uh, presentation uh, this morning. Uh, thank you, it's a pleasure to be here at this conference uh, and to be a part of this panel. Um, I'd like to just start off my talk today with an anecdote of an early Reagan NSC meeting uh, discussing NSDD 32, a uh, national security directive uh, that not only guided Reagan's overall security policy, but controversially ordered planning for a protracted nuclear war. Uh, in this 1982 meeting, uh, Reagan asked his advisors why can't we just lean on the Soviets until they go broke? Uh, his NSC principles um, immediately warned against this notion. Uh, they held the mainstream view that the Soviet economy, though sluggish or uneven, could sustain current levels of defense spending at roughly 16% of GDP. Uh, Henry Rowan, however, the chairman of the National Intelligence Committee, uh, he chimed in from his seat along the wall that uh, he said, yes, you can, Mr. President. Uh, actually, they're spending about 50 percent of GDP on defense, and they're going broke. Uh, for Reagan, the enduring optimist that he was, uh, this was really all he needed to hear. And he informed the room that uh, this was the direction we're going to go. So today, I want to kind of illuminate the sensibility that Reagan conveyed in this meeting. Uh, how it was shared by James Schlesinger and his cohort of strategists, uh, many of whom would go on to serve in key positions in the Reagan-era uh, Pentagon. Uh, and how uh, this sensibility really encouraged the rebellion in the late 1960s against arms control orthodoxy. Uh, Reagan's grasp of Soviet vulnerabilities, Soviet weaknesses, was largely intuitive, more, more a product of his um, enduring optimism, his faith in human ingenuity, um, democratic capitalism, than any really rigorous assessment of the uh, military investment balance. Uh, this being the case, I contend that the direction of Reagan's nuclear buildup, the specific shape it took, uh, relied really on the strategic thought of these revivalists um, I'm going to, to discuss today. Um, the group consisted of Schlesinger's Rand colleagues, um, who would later serve in the Reagan administration, people like Rowan, uh, Fred Ickle, Andrew Marshall, and Graham Allison. Uh, Schlesinger was a pioneering figure in this group, um, and he captured their strategic sensibility um, when he referred to himself as Secretary of Defense in 1974 as a revivalist of the American defense establishment. Um, so the revivalists believed that the Soviets were not 10 feet tall um, and that the strategic arms competition could be accelerated and even won uh, with shrewd competition. So my central argument today is that the limited nuclear options developed by Schlesinger, Ickel, Marshall um, were more than just a strictly defensive effort to simply re-extend deterrence to Western Europe. Um, after the Soviet buildup in the late 60s, um, even with the introduction of the SS-20 theater ballistic missile in 1976 and 77, 
I contend that Reagan era planning must also be understood as the culmination of the revivalist really long-term program stretching back to the Ford administration to regain the initiative in the peacetime competition. Uh, so the revivalist strategic outlook actually dated back to Schlesinger's time as a University of Virginia economics professor where he published a book in 1960 uh, that was really the first public broadside um, against CIA estimates of the Soviet defense burden. Um, in the interest of time, I won't go into great length like I did in my paper about why Schlesinger arrived at this conclusion, but I think it is instructive here um, to just note that by the mid-1950s, Schlesinger believed that the United States could impose disproportionate costs on the Soviet Union in a peacetime competition um, and that the Soviet defense burden was unsustainable in the long run um, and that this um, vulnerability was, uh, like discussed in the keynote last night, was the, the Kremlin relied on military spending for economic stability. So strategic industries like ICBM production um, was for social and economic stability as opposed to external American provocations, uh, uh, external American stimuli. So Schlesinger's unorthodox views uh, won the approval of equally unconventional strategists at the Rand Corporation in the 1960s um, who recruited him to join their team in 1963. Um, and in fact, his principal collaborator, uh, Andrew Marshall, recalled that Schlesinger arrived in Santa Monica um, with the idea that the object was outlasting the Soviets and encouraging them to devote resources to activities that were less threatening or even favorable um, to the United States. So Schlesinger's strategic sensibility, this revivalist sensibility, really clashed with the rise of 1960s nuclear orthodoxy, arms control orthodoxy, um, which adhered to an image of an inescapable nuclear stalemate um, in which strategic arms competition was futile, uh, wasteful, if not dangerously reckless. Um, so I'd just like to briefly summarize the four core principles of arms control orthodoxy, um, which like uh, officials like Robert McNamara really insisted that the emergence of a survivable Soviet second strike posture um, had rendered planning for disarming first strike, had rendered planning for sophisticated weapon systems pointless. Um, building a strategic edge was impossible, and for this reason, um, in, in uh, 1967, for instance, he enunciated this action-reaction paradigm of arms interactions, um, which can best be thought of if one side deployed offensive, defensive missiles or a mix of them, it would be rapidly countered um, with either a symmetrical um, deployment or a countervailing deployment of its own. Um, and this kind of left an image of the Soviets as 10 feet tall. It could overcome economic and technological uh, difficulties to match this uh, American uh, initiatives. And Paul Warnke, a leading arms controller, really summed up the action-reaction paradigm when he uh, likened the superpowers to apes on a treadmill to nowhere. Um, he said they were building redundant quantities of weapon systems um, and making unneeded technological improvements to the strategic nuclear posture. So McNamara's image and Warnke's image conveyed, uh, conveyed really the sense that the Soviets were 10 feet tall. They could compete um, with the United States uh, effectively in a long-term strategic arms competition. Um, in this sense, the Soviets, uh, McNamara and Warnke believed that the Soviets accepted the idea of mutual vulnerability. They accepted the idea of mutual shared destruction. Uh, Schlesinger and the revivalists, like Ickel, on the other hand, um, categorically rejected mutual shared destruction as not only uh, immoral, um, but strategically unsound. Um, the revivalists concluded that the action-reaction paradigm rested on a deeply flawed image of hyper-rational uh, hyper actors. Um, and Schlesinger lambasted this model as a half-baked speculation um, that failed to take into account, as he wrote, considerations of bureaucratic or economic feasibility. 
Uh, so rather than a tightly coupled or imitative arms race, um, arms responses were bound by these non-rational soft factors that could not be measured by the systems analysts. Um, they were more shaped by internal stimuli, routinized organized behavior, uh, vested bureaucratic interest, and these technological economic constraints that the Soviet Union uh, struggled under. Uh, and Marshall perceptively recognized this along with Schlesinger and Ickel in the late 1960s that Soviet planning was less a product of American developments and more a product of the fact, uh, like was mentioned last night, the Soviets literally had to keep building more um, for economic and social stability. Um, although at that time, uh, Schlesinger and Marshall believed um, this came from the Soviet uh, strategic rocket forces, as opposed to, I think, what post-Cold War testimonial shows, it came from really uh, the design bureaus, the defense industrialists. So Ickel, Marshall, and Schlesinger's image of a slower, loosely coupled arms interaction was informed um, by a seminar group uh, led by uh, Graham Allison, then a young uh, doctoral student and RAND adjunct, um, a group that became known as the Ernest Mays Group on Bureaucratic Politics. Um, the group included Ickel, Marshall, and Rowan, and they kept Schlesinger informed on their findings. And this bureaucratic policy group, um, as it was known then, reaffirmed Schlesinger's conviction um, that the Soviet strategic initiatives were as much a product of internal stimuli, like I said, as opposed to American uh, force developments. Um, but perhaps the most consequential finding of this group came from the business school uh, professors uh, who joined the group in that the, uh, the Soviet Union and the United States should be seen as business firms composed of warring subgroups and that these subgroups um, had uh, various distinctive uh, competencies that the United States would not have or the Soviet Union would not have. Uh, the Soviet Union and the United States were distinctive entities that had their own comparative advantages, comparative weaknesses. And so uh, armed with this dynamic image of the strategic arms competition, Schlesinger set out as defense secretary in the mid-1970s um, to redress what he viewed as the systems analyst McNamara's tendency to uh, turn the Soviet Union into an uh, invincible 10-foot-tall bear, as Schlesinger uh, liked to criticize McNamara for. Uh, taking a cue from Allison and the May Group, Schlesinger determined that the United States should convey or uh, array uh, America's nuclear competencies, uh, information technologies, greater accuracy against the Soviets' distinctive vulnerabilities, the Soviets' um, uh, in McNamara's mind, irrational tendency to pour enormous resources into strategic air defenses, which by that point, the United States was conducting a tremendous drawdown in air defenses. The Soviets were building up to a point that was irrational to the systems analysts. Um, both Ickel, serving as the director of the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency in the Ford administration, and Marshall, who Schlesinger installed as the first director of the Office of Net Assessment, uh, they agreed with Schlesinger that sophisticated nuclear warfighting technologies uh, constituted a competitive advantage. Uh, they aimed to harness America's enduring lead in information technologies to posture highly accurate weapon systems for controlled and selective nuclear employment. Uh, but the thinking, though, was that accuracy was not enough. Um, these weapon systems needed to be postured uh, for flexible and selective attack to conduct a protracted nuclear war. Um, straining under the weight of its uh, enormous defense burden, uh, Schlesinger believed that the Kremlin could hardly undergo a simultaneous expansion of defensive and offensive systems, like McNamara believed they very well could. Um, and he also believed uh, that McNamara's adherence to the action-reaction paradigm had saddled the U.S. posture with a counterforce plan without counterforce weapons. Uh, McNamara had tried to induce Soviet cooperation and arms control agreements uh, by canceling the MX missile, what became the MX missile. Uh, he opposed modernization of the aging theater ballistic missile posture. Uh, 
Uh, so things like the Pershing II would not receive a follow-on modernization. Uh, he opposed things such as a, a cruise missile, um, the modern-day version, that is, um, of terrain-hugging guidance systems. Um, so Schlesinger, with his time in the Pentagon under Nixon and Ford, really initiated this long-term modernization program. He initiated, initiated important parts of it that were already underway. Uh, so, for instance, he approved of the full-scale development of the MX missile, which R Donald Rumsfeld, his successor, passed on to Ford. Uh, he approved the B-1 penetrating bomber program, canceled by McNamara. Uh, Schlesinger convinced the Army uh, and ceded money to extend the range of the Pershing uh, two follow-on, which was then already in development. Um, him and uh, William Clements were really the modern-day, uh, the fathers of the modern-day cruise missile. Um, I mean, for instance, he also uh, negotiated a delicate truce with the Navy, who uh, insisted on city-busting inaccurate ballistic missiles. Schlesinger convinced them that the Trident II, um, used by Reagan, brought online by Re the Reagan administration, should be accurate and it should be a counterforce weapon. Um, not necessarily that a nuclear war was actually going to occur, that we could fight and win a nuclear war, but this would impose costs on the Soviet Union in this extended peacetime competition. So Schlesinger essentially targeted his program to intensify the Soviet kind of bureaucratic predisposition to pour enormous resources into air defenses, which was really a pathological legacy that uh, Schlesinger believed stemmed from the devastation wrought by the German Luftwaffe in World War II. Uh, Schlesinger's deputy, in fact, he raved about the cruise missile, the air-breathing missile, because as he told uh, Kissinger, to Kissinger's disdain, in a, in a seat meeting that uh, the cruise missile will drive the Soviets up the wall because their defenses will not protect them from our cruise missiles, and the Soviets know this. Um, when uh, Kissinger complained to Schlesinger that they were starting a cruise missile arms race, um, Schlesinger could only laugh to Kissinger. He told Kissinger that for the next decade uh, or more, we will be alone in the ability to deploy our terrain-hugging guidance systems in our cruise missiles. Um, so by posturing these forces for a selective and discriminant nuclear warfare, um, this would exacerbate the Soviet fragile defense industrial base. Um, the Soviets could not field comparable systems uh, that could uh, showcase such control and flexibility um, in a theoretical nuclear war. Um, so Schlesinger conveyed in a classified address, for instance, in 1974, that the goal of this long-term program was to develop a strategic edge in terms of hypothetical warfighting capabilities. Um, so in this way, the revivalists were attempting to transcend uh, mutual vulnerability as Schlesinger said, he was trying to blow away the idea of mutual shared destruction and mutual vulnerability. Um, so although Schlesinger's uh, vision in the short term was thwarted, the Air Force was not interested in limited nuclear options. Um, so bureaucratic uh, resistance in the short term really stifled his program. Um, beginning in the early 1980s with the Reagan administration, uh, the Reagan administration, people like Fred Ickel, then the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy, energized this long-term program that had been underway, first and forward, then Carter administration, to an extent the Carter administration, um, and then all these systems were brought online in the 1980s. Um, as Ickel informed a group of labor leaders in 1982, um, he, he told the labor leaders that we'll increase our military expenditures, we'll steer it into channels that will make it increasingly difficult for the Soviets to compete with us, and at the same time, we are going to work on denying them access to technology. Essentially, the revivalist spirit um, in action. Um, in 1982, Ickel drafted further guidance um, to strengthen technical capabilities for a protracted and discriminate nuclear war. Um, these weapon systems, his directive stipulated, should be difficult for the Soviets to counter, they should impose disproportionate costs, and they should open up new areas of major military competition where the Soviets uh, really cannot match us. Um, Allison supported these efforts by chairing the Competitive Strategy Steering Group in the Pentagon, which was a subgroup 
of uh, Frank Carlucci's uh, Competitive Strategies Initiative, which looked to integrate strategic nuclear forces with conventional planning. Um, and such programs institutionalized for a brief moment in the mid to late 1980s, this revivalist sensibility that Carlucci uh, really emphasized and promoted. Um, so as for Rowan, whose lonely voice had uh, supported Reagan in that 1982 meeting, uh, he subsequently led a study group of Soviet emigre economists and workers um, to investigate really the depths of the Soviet uh, financial despair. So really this talk today, just to wrap up, is not so much to weigh in on the enduring debate over the Soviet economy um, to the extent military spending was devoted to GDP, um, or really to weigh in on the efficacy of the Reagan grand strategy. Um, my intent today is to more inform, uh, provi uh, provide greater depth to uh, Reagan's planning for a protracted nuclear war. It, it was most certainly, um, as scholars have uh, really brilliantly noted, um, through the 70s and 80s, it was very much um, this effort to fill holes in the deterrence gap that they believed were opening. But I think it should also be seen as this competitive strategy um, to impose costs. Uh, accuracy was not enough. Uh, these systems had to be postured um, for a selective and discriminant nuclear campaign. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Kyle. Uh, next up, we have Nick Eckenrode. Uh, Nick is a captain in the U.S. Air Force. He's also currently a graduate student at Ohio State University, uh, where he's working on a dissertation, The Limits of Peace, Carter, Reagan, and the Strategic Missteps Towards Nuclear War. Towards, as we didn't quite get there, fortunately, <laughs> towards. And in May uh, of 2024, he will become an instructor at the U.S. Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction. And uh, I'm really honored to be here as a part of this panel. And I really appreciate every single one of you all coming out here today. So, oh, pardon me, let me grab that. As the uh, date suggests, we're going to go back to the beginning. All right. So, reflecting on the historic nature of the 1980 presidential election, it may come as a surprise for some that leading up to it, Republican candidate Ronald Reagan and incumbent Democratic President Jimmy Carter met only once on the debate stage. Furthermore, their meeting had been pushed so far down the timeline, as the date suggests, that it didn't take place until a week before the election. With over 80 million Americans tuning in that night, their loan debate was the highest rate in history at that time. I think 2016 blew it out of the water, but I'll double check that. <laughs> One of the central issues discussed was the condition of the United States military. Reagan had long criticized Carter on his foreign policy, accusing him of allowing the nation's defense to deteriorate under his watch. All while the Soviet Union continued to amass conventional forces in Eastern Europe, rapidly expanding their navy and their overall sphere of influence. Reagan's attacks and his famous quip, there you go again, stole the show from a beleaguered Carter on his way to winning the election in a landslide. Much of Reagan's legacy is symbolized by his massive military buildup. And with decades of separation from these events, it's reasonable to ask whether Reagan capitalized on public perception of a weak president in 1980, or had military readiness legitimately slid to dangerous levels. Moreover, if the warning signs were so clear for Reagan and other critics, why did Carter not identify them or act on them. True, Reagan's reforms were intended to signal to allies and adversaries of a national and globally visible shift in foreign policy from that of the Carter era. However, the buildup under Reagan sought more than jumpstarting an arms race to catch up with the Soviet Union. He keenly understood that the armed forces suffered a crisis of confidence of their own, that the low morale stemmed from perceptions that military service was no longer valued by the nation and resulted in more hardship than anything else. If we examine this issue from a single service branch, in this case, the Navy, we can evaluate the veracity of Reagan's 1980 campaign claims and whether or not his subsequent military reforms had the positive impact that he intended. 
After the Nixon and Ford years, American opinions of government were low, perceiving them as coldly pragmatic, corrupt, and incompetent, all symbolized by the U.S. defeat in Vietnam, the Watergate scandal, and a series of oil crises instigated by OPEC, causing gas prices to soar in the United States. Moreover, regarding international affairs, the U.S. was encountering an increasingly multipolar system, while America seemed to be shrinking in its prestige and stature. These are the events largely paving the way for Jimmy Carter's victory in 1976. The former governor of Georgia and self-declared Washington outsider campaigned, amongst other things, on slowing the economic crisis and to control government spending that included cuts to a bloated defense budget in his eyes. This also complemented Carter's primary goal of reorienting U.S. foreign policy by placing an emphasis on human rights and diplomatic endeavors versus the projection of military strength abroad. Parallel to these events, the Navy's decline began in the Vietnam War. Throughout the conflict, defense funding primarily supported the Army and Air Force, with naval operations reduced largely to tactical support for land forces ashore. The change in mission set resulted in cost-cutting programs to reduce the overall number of ships in the fleet and to maximize available resources where they could find them. As a result, those vessels retained now shouldered the extra load in maintaining operations tempo, further stretching the fleet then. The detrimental effects trickled down to service members in the form of reduced pay and deployments increasing from six to 12 months. As a consequence, the Navy suffered dwindling numbers of qualified personnel to man and maintain the fleet, placing its military readiness on tenuous footing by the time of Carter's victory. Within months of taking office, the Carter administration produced Presidential Review Memorandum 10, which intended to evaluate the overall national strategy and military capabilities. Specifically, it sought to improve the mobility or excuse me, the ability of forces in Europe to better absorb an initial attack from the Soviet Union, while also envisioning a smaller mobile force capable of rapid global deployment, which coincided with Carter's swing strategy, in which, in the event of war between NATO and the Soviet Union, the U.S. would swing substantial naval forces from the Western Pacific to Europe in aiding its defense. This modified strategy meant rather than maintaining a navy capable of countering multiple global threats, the fleet would shrink and simply divert forces as needed. Due to this strategy, the Navy was relegated further to a defensive posture, with a role in convoying wartime supplies across the Atlantic. Additionally, shipbuilding programs were slowed, or outright canceled, to include the uh, future nuclear-powered carriers that, uh, and early retirements for older vessels. John Lehman, Secretary of the Navy under Reagan, cites these cuts as a primary reason the Soviet Navy surpassed the United States in offensive capabilities by 1978 in numerically superiority in warships. Furthermore, in an attempt to halt defense spending, Carter installed a ceiling on military pay, leaving it perilously behind the growing inflation of the country. By the midpoint of his presidency, the effects were detrimental enough that Harold Brown, his Secretary of Defense, appealed to him to reconsider portions of the budget for fiscal year 1979, specifically the ongoing issue of monetary compensation for military members. According to Brown, recruiting and retaining military personnel was becoming a real issue, in large part due to current military pay falling failing to keep pace with costs of living and competing civilian opportunities. Although Carter was increasing military pay by 5.5% in his planned budget, it failed to match the rate of inflation, which was closer to 10% at the time. Carter must not have appreciated Brown's pitch, as, in a later memo, he rebuked the defense secretary, stating that the issue of recruiting and retention was due to low morale. However, that low morale was fueled by the frequent negative statements from the Defense Department and the Joint Chiefs, on the decline in military capability. Carter concluded by writing, you should assess other factors involved in low enlistment problems. When I served in the Navy, money was not the predominant concern. While Carter is not to blame for every setback throughout his administration, this event highlights what became a theme of the president that was frequently, frequently out of step with his administration and the American people. In certain issues, he failed to see the big picture. Despite the president's denial, Brown and the Joint Chiefs remained in sync as the numbers continued to tell a disturbing story. By the midway point of Carter's presidency, members of the armed forces earned 7 to 19 percent less than their civilian counterparts in similar career fields. Due to this, the service branches were hemorrhaging pilots and mechanics to opportunities with commercial airlines. The following year, the Joint Chiefs reported that real buying power and standard of living of military personnel had dropped dramatically, with average disposable, disposable income falling to 11.5% of total income, compared to just over 22% six years earlier. 
I went backwards. Nonetheless, Carter was notoriously stubborn on the issue, and he only acquiesced under a full court press within the administration. Even then, the amendments to the budget fell below requests, forcing the service branches to continue in military lexicon to do more with less. Reviewing this time of hardship, then Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Thomas Hayward, did not mince words, stating, believe me, the condition of the Navy from 1975 to 81, it was as bad as I hope it will ever be. Material condition, procurement, support, personnel, all disastrous. The lack of resources was scary. Now, the accounts of the Defense Department officials and the Joint Chiefs are helpful as they provide a better understanding of the deep cracks within the defense establishment. However, the messaging of senior leaders can only tell us so much, as they are so far removed from day-to-day -day operations that their familiar familiarity is limited to a synthesis of various reports. However, if we pair their accounts with the memories of veterans who entered active duty in this period, we can more accurately gauge the exasperating effects of Carter's policies on a depleted Navy. In interviews with alumni from the Naval Academy class of 1976, numerous veterans detailed disillusionment upon reporting to their first assignment. Retired Vice Admiral Richard Gallagher summarized, in all regards, the climate was poor. We were undermanned and not well trained. A huge lack of spare parts and not enough money to fly or steam our ships to maintain optimal readiness. Others recalled the dismal culture due to the hangover from Vietnam syndrome, but also rampant illegal activity, with one veteran observing that the Navy was poorly funded and full of drugs. Collectively, the responses go on to confirm the reports of Secretary Brown and the Joint Chiefs that were brought to Carter's attention. They highlight the issue of Naval pilots getting up and out, as they called it, to fly for the airlines, rather than commit to another lengthy sea tour. Several responses spoke to the fleet's poor maintenance due to the personnel issues, with one veteran quipping that the Navy had been run hard and put up wet, and that the ships were in sorry shape. Furthermore, this inability to properly maintain the fleet snowballed, resulting in the reports of ships failing to leave port for their scheduled exercises and deployments on time. This also extended to the crews, as a common practice began by shuffling sailors between ships simply to meet the requisite deployment manning. One of the more shocking revelations was the extent of financial hardship faced while on active duty, especially amongst enlisted and junior officers. In a distressing demonstration of camaraderie between shipmates, one veteran recalled that in particularly tough times, their units would pool and donate money to married sailors with families to help them make ends meet. Another went on to say that it was not uncommon to find sailors surviving on food stamps. Between the veterans' experience and the accounts of senior leaders, they paint a bleak picture, suggesting that the Navy's readiness existed more on paper than in reality, all compounded by Carter's failure to recognize or adequately address the issue. The negative effect went beyond workplace conditions, as by the late 1970s, service members were losing faith in their government. Taking all this together, Reagan's criticism of Carter appears legitimate, and he spoke to it frequently throughout his campaign. In the weeks before the debate, in a nationally televised address, Reagan articulated once more his commitment to strengthening the quality of the military. Speaking directly to members of the armed forces, he made clear the value of those who serve, and that critical to any defense plan is the sacrifice of the all-volunteer force. As such, the country also had a duty to provide their families with the security, the incentives, and improved quality of life commiserate with that sacrifice. That's the order. Upon entering office in 1981, Reagan wasted no time launching his military buildup. With expenditures totaling $1.5 trillion over the first five years, the increased spending benefited the entire military by producing new missiles, bombers, fights, fighter jets, and submarines, all towards achieving his goal of peace through strength. Beyond the procurement of much-needed modern weapon systems, the ordinary sailor failed the transformation by Reagan in meaningful ways as he increased the pay of service members so desperately needed in the previous administration and provided the resources to build and maintain a new modernized fleet capable of projecting global power. After years of neglect, the Navy felt it had purpose once more. Overwhelmingly, the veteran response to Reagan's tenure is positive, describing the excitement as palpable throughout the service force as they were finally equipping and going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Soviet Navy. One veteran commenting that the reforms made us feel like the Navy was serious about doing its job. For Vice Admiral Gallagher, he put it simply, 
the Reagan years were good to us. Reagan's buildup did not take place without issue. Domestically, it was scrutinized by political opponents for what seemed like never-ending spending in defense, which in later years did result in cases of fraud, waste, and abuse. Furthermore, instead of signaling a strong deterrent to the Soviets, it inadvertently sent a message of possible war preparation. Reagan's reforms, coupled with his bellicose rhetoric, actually increased hostility at times between the superpowers, nearly resulting in a cat uh, catastrophic conflict in the war scare of 1983. However, a distinction can and should be made. As he took office, there was a genuine need to reinvigorate the military establishment and shed the heavy weight of Vietnam syndrome. While President Reagan's two terms in office present plenty of opportunities for objective critique, it is equally important to acknowledge what he got right. At this crucial crossroad in our nation's history, Reagan understood that what the armed forces lost post-Vietnam was its confidence and faith. As a starting point, the restoration of military pride and feeling valued by the nation were crucial before any defense strategy could be effectively implemented, something Carter neither understood nor achieved during his presidency. Reagan may have started in Hollywood, but his sincere love of the military was no act, and it ran far more deeply, profoundly so, than political rhetoric. His unwavering support of the armed forces resonated with the American people, and more importantly, the men and women in uniform throughout his presidency. In this regard, he was exactly the president the armed forces needed to escape its crisis of confidence. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nick. And next up we have, we're working on the slides, we have uh, Dr. Professor Anand Deprani, uh, is a professor at the U.S. Naval War College. Uh, he's the author of the 2019 book, Oil and the Great Powers, written in Germany, 1914 to 1945. And more recently, he is a co-author of American Defense Reform, Lessons from Failure and Success in Navy History. I want to thank uh, both uh, chair of this panel uh, for his uh, inter kind of introduction and, of course, the Reagan Foundation, not just for inviting me, but for having uh, so skillfully organized this particular panel because, uh, you know, Nicholas gave a very – Nick or Nicholas? Either or. Mom calls me Nicholas. Nicholas. <laughs> Nicholas. Uh, Nicholas gave a really interesting presentation about the promise of the Reagan administration. And I'm gonna spend this presentation talking about the reality of what, of what Reagan actually delivered on. And uh, it's not a paper, it's a presentation, because you know what, who needs to hear another, you know, another paper? We haven't had enough coffee. I'm just gonna, in a sense, give you a few ideas, talk to slides, because I work for DOD, nothing happens in the Pentagon without slides. So just listen to me, don't worry about anything else, I'll, I'll point it out all, all on the slides. So when we're talking about the 1980s, I spend most of my time like marinating in a naval milieu. And I use terms that any like naval person would understand, but now that I'm with real people, some of this stuff may not be you know common knowledge. And so two terms I'm gonna talk about a great deal are the maritime strategy and the 600-ship navy. The maritime strategy, briefly put, was the naval component of the Reagan administration's strategy of campaign, that we were going to go into Soviet waters and kick their asses. Forgive my, pardon my French. Uh, you know, we weren't going to stand back on the defensive and just let the Soviets have the initiative. The 600-ship Navy was, in a sense, a tangible expression of the, of the Navy that was going to be built to implement the maritime strategy. 600 ships is a sort of talisman uh, in Navy lore. Never before or since has a specific force structure ever been part of a presidential platform. You can look for it, but you'll never find an administration committing itself to a specific number of platforms. That's the term the DOD uses for ships and uh, ships, planes, and whatever. So both these terms have an extraordinary sort of resonance and importance in the 1980s. Now, let's step up, let's back up. At the War College, what do most of my colleagues do? Some of them are strategists. They sit and they read Clausewitz and they pontificate about big, broad issues that have no relevance to day-to-day -day affairs. 
Some of my colleagues teach operations, which is, in a sense, uh, the planning of campaigns and battles. Some of my colleagues are tacticians. They look at the level of specific engagement, ship against ship, sub against sub, uh, missile against missile. I am none of those things. I am what we call a budget wonk. Why? Probably because I'm emotionally stunted, but <laughs> budgets are, I think, the most important aspect of understanding what happens in the DOD because, and I'm gonna quote someone here who actually wrote a very kind review of an article I wrote many years ago. He wrote, uh, his name is Benjamin Fordham. He's a political scientist at uh, SUNY Binghamton and a student of David Painter, undergraduate student of David Painter. He says, uh, to start off this review, when I want to avoid a conversation about my work with an airline seatmate or a stranger at, my par at a party, I sometimes tell them I study budgeting. <laughs> this is true if incomplete and reliably moves the conversation on to something else. <laughs> Budgets can certainly be arcane and technical and may thus be superficially less interesting than other aspects of foreign and defense policy. In fact, they are among its most important elements. Budgets are where policy commitments are either made or exposed as hollow rhetoric. So just to give you a brief abstract of my paper, and this last time I'm gonna read something uh, to you. John Lehman and his uh, research assistant, uh, Captain Peter Schwartz, admitted in their book, Ocean Venture, uh, it's there at the bottom right, that the ocean venture operation of 1981, when uh, the U.S. Second Fleet went into Soviet waters into the Barents Sea, which it had not gone into in a long time, was in certain tactical and technological respects a quote-unquote bluff. That's a term Lehman uses. Because the various technologies for U.S. naval forces to operate deep in Soviet waters had yet to be integrated into the fleet. But what if the entire fleet, the entire 600-ship navy, was in fact a bluff? Soviet naval... Sorry, U.S. naval planners admitted that 600 ships was not actually not the optimal force structure to implement the various theater war plans uh, in the event of an all-out conventional war with the Soviet Union, but rather the limit of what was politically feasible when justifying the Navy's budget to Congress. Even then, Lehman recognized that the 600-ship Navy was only viable over the long term if he implemented certain procurement reforms to limit weapons cost growth to 3%. And I'm going to explain what I mean by cost growth later on. Navy programmers, another term I'll explain, Navy programmers having nothing to do with software, countered based on historical and quantitative analysis that Lehman's claims were unrealistic and pressed him to ask Congress for more money. This was impossible, however, because it would have run contrary to the Reagan administration's wider defense policies, which, like the Carter administration, and however much the Navy doesn't want to accept this, which, like the Carter administration, focused on the defense of Central Europe. And, and asking for more money would have upset the delicate inter-service budgetary truce that had prevailed since the revolt of the admirals in 1940, when the U.S. Navy basically launched a coup d'etat against the Truman administration. Ultimately, contrary to Lehman's claims in the 1980s, political and budgetary realities played an equal role as strategic imperatives in the shaping of the size of the U.S. Navy, even during its renaissance in the Reagan years. So, there's two sets of problems that I want to introduce you to when studying defense budgets. The first problem, and this is a point that was made uh, uh, by British scholars uh, in the past, but I think it also applies to the United States. The, go the growth in weapons cost always is always higher than the growth in national income. Weapons get more expensive. Our, uh, the rate of weapons growth is higher than our rate of economic growth, which means that ultimately if budgets remain at real or uh, basically at, if the real rate of budget growth is zero, that, that includes inflation, it means ultimately the size of the force will decline. You can't... You, because things get more expensive, unless you're increasing the budget faster than the growth of national income, the size of your force will naturally get smaller because you're buying fewer and fewer platforms because they cost more. Second, and this applies specifically to the Navy, there's a trade-off between what I call, this is my uh, formulation, there's a trade-off between ship numbers, the largest Navy possible to perform the largest set of missions possible, and modernization. In other words, as a way of understanding, there's a trade-off between your present set of capabilities, what I can do now, 
and your future capabilities, what I'd like to do in 10, 20, 30 years. You cannot modernize a ship while it's at sea. The, the analogy of Theseus' ship, all right? You cannot rebuild a ship while it's on the water. Ships are either on station, resources are either devoted towards supporting those ships on station, or they're devoted towards modernization. You cannot do both at the same time. If you want modernization, if you want ship numbers, you must forsake modernization. If you want modernization, even if budgets are rising, ship numbers will inevitably decline because unit cost growth, even within established programs, even within things we know how to build, uh, often exceeds the growth in defense spending because systems become more complex and uh, have a higher upper end of capabilities over time. John Lehman chose the former option. He chose to maximize the number of ships that the U.S. Navy had at one particular point in time so it could fulfill a set of missions related to what the administration wanted. In a sense, he was leveraging investments that the Carter administration and, uh, and Schlesinger and others had made in the 1970s uh, by focusing on the development and production of mature technologies that were susceptible to cost growth control. He was fairly ruthless against private firms, uh, not just by imposing fixed price contracts and ending, quote unquote, gold plating, letting the military do whatever it wanted in terms of deciding how many capabilities it wanted. Uh, the problem is with that approach, again, the trade-off is still at, at work. Layman wanted the largest Navy at, uh, any, uh, uh, at that specific moment in time. All he did was kick the modernization can down the road. At some point, someone after Lehman would have to pay that modernization bill when the fleet that he had built became obsolete. So this paper assesses or explores John Lehman's confrontation with the analysts responsible for uh, producing that analysis, who were tasked with assessing the, long the Navy's long-term budget outlook using what's known as the extended planning annex, and I'll explain what that is. The EPA was revolutionary for its time in incorporating long-term fiscal constraints and problems arising from cost growth into its analysis. Traditionally, this document had been done by hand. The person who did the last one told me they literally input the data by hand on spreadsheets. But starting in 1982, you had this revolutionary new technology known as personal computers, which allowed them to, to input the data electronically and basically do a level of analysis that was un, unimaginable to their predecessors. So this paper explains the nature of these analysts dispute with Lehman and sheds light on the long-term fiscal challenges that hindered the sustainment of a larger Navy, both in the 1980s and at present. Okay, so these are some of the people who are gonna be characters in my story. Uh, of course, we have President Reagan beside John Lehman at the commissioning of, I think that was USS Iowa or New Jersey, I forget. In, it was one of, those, one, one, one of the battleships. The guy beside them is a guy named uh, Carl Trost, he was a CNO uh, at the end of Lehman's tenure. Lehman resigned because he had become CNO. They had feuded uh, viciously over budgetary issues because before he was CNO, his job was what was known as the Op 090. He was the Navy's lead programmer. He was the budget guy in the Navy who told civilians what they could actually afford. Um, the guys below him are some of the analysts who worked for him. Uh, one guy is named Jack Baldwin. Uh, who was his sort of immediate, de immediate deputy. Another guy is Bill Manthorpe, who is the leading expert on the Soviet Navy. I have a wider version of this, a wider, a larger version of this presentation where I talk a little bit more about him, but I don't have time to. The other two guys are also very interesting. One is a guy named Harlan Ullman. He's sort of a gadfly in defense circles, uh, but he's sort of like the Forrest Gump of like, post of like Cold War naval history, like he was always there at specific points in time, <laughs> like meeting important people. Uh, and the guy beside him actually was, an was a really important source for me. The guy's uh, name is Steve Woodall. That's a picture of him at this time. Uh, Woodall was Ullman's deputy. And he's the one who actually did the work that Ullman took credit for. And he's the guy who actually explained to me uh, all of this stuff. So I'm talking about, like, I'm giving you all these terms like, EPA, budget, programming, like what the hell am I talking about? Now, we really do not need to get into the specifics of the Pentagon budget, or we're never gonna get finished. Here's what you need to know. 
there's the theoretical view of, of how this works if you had like a high school, like, you know, high school civics class. If we were like listening to Schoolhouse Rock. <laughs> like the president has like a national security strategy. This turns into a, nas a national, national uh, security strategy. This turns into a national defense strategy that the SECDEF drafts. That national defense strategy becomes what's known as defense guidance that goes to the services, and the services then develop the budget. Now, here's the most important thing you need to, and I thought we'd have a bigger sort of set of slides so you could, you could see this better. I'm sorry. I can share the slides with you if we want. Defense, defense guidance goes to what's known as development of the program objective memorandum. This is the most important document in the Pentagon. This is the basis of the Pentagon's budget. And it is developed entirely by the military services using the guidance that is provided by their civilian leaders. So you need to understand how this process works, because this, again, is how the entire budget is constructed. It's a legacy of the McNamara era. And rather than having the, uh, the services simply say, we want this many planes, we want this many fighters, we want this many ships, they have to justify their requirements on the basis of what are known as major force programs. All right, strategic forces, general purpose forces. Strategic forces are nukes, general purpose forces are everything else, whatever. This is the building block of the Pentagon budget. And of course, to make things more complicated, the Pentagon goes through this whole process and then has to change the budget categories because Congress uses a different set of categories. Mm -hmm. DOD appropriations are not program based. They're based on these antiquated sort of notions of personnel, construction, or procurement, whatever. So it's an incredibly time-consuming and probably redundant process. Here's the important thing you need to know. At any given point in time, the Pentagon is working on three or four budgets simultaneously. Right? There is no point, in, uh, point at which you can simply take a breath and wait. The moment you finish one budget, you immediately start working on the next budget. And you are working at different stages of different budgets simultaneously. And as one budget here told me, if you don't contribute to this process in the Pentagon, you do not matter. Because the palm waits for no one, and the palm is eternal. And this process is ongoing and is so grueling, so grinding, that it eventually squishes every idealistic officer into a fine paste, <laughs> at which point they move on to their next assignment. So <laughs> understand, you're working on multiple budgets at the same time. Then there's something that's known as, when you actually come up with a budget, you develop what's known as a, a FIDF. For a nation that supposedly opposed communism, for us to, to adopt a five-year defense plan as, you know, as a basis of building block of our defense budget is kind of odd. Uh, but that's what it's called. The FIDIP is just like the Palm. Uh, the Palm is a five-year, uh, is a five-year sort of you know uh, assumption of what the budget is going to look like for a service. The FIDIP is the five-year plan for the entire defense budget. That's all we need to get into. I can talk your ear off about it, but you really don't want to hear it. Anyways, so now there's this there's this process five years out. But as we know, how often, how, how long do you think, say, ships last on average? What's the life expectancy of a ship? About 30 years. If you're going to actually model the long-term cost of these things, you can't just limit it to five years, because once you buy something, you actually have to maintain it. That has to be budgeted. There's no point in buying ships that you can't actually maintain. So the Navy has this idea that we're going to actually take this five-year uh, POM, and then we're going to do what's known as an EPA that goes 10 years beyond it, so we can actually have some real sort of understanding of what our long-term costs are. This is, I showed you this document just because Woodall shared it with me. I couldn't find it in Navy, in Navy archives. The most important thing is the second paragraph. And this is a, a memo from Trost. In my view, EPAs have little credibility as planning tools since many of the assumptions made in their derivation are unrealistic. The recommended guidelines provided as enclosure follow a bottom-up approach, building and costing the total program by summing up the elements of the plan program. So the attempt to actually impose real controls, real rigor in terms of what the long-term costs of what you were buying was. Not just focusing on the immediate costs, but the long-term costs. And again, there was, this was a slide that was attached to it. There, you know, there's what you think the budget's going to be, and then that, that little delta, that's a military term between, for gap. The gap between what's, you know, what's your expected cost and what was your possible cost, the gap between that is do it cost 
that if things get out of control, you might end up actually having to spend a lot more than you had expected. And these are some notes that uh, went to uh, went to the analysts. Trost was a real admirer of the work they had done. You know, tell Steve what I'll uh, like his EPA paper. They attached for Steve stocking suitable for framing. Well done. Uh, the first one of the uh, this is the first one of these I've seen. Steve, outstanding job. Clearly the best EPA. I've seen. So high praise, would all still frame that, keeps it at home. <laughs> this is the document. Well, it's actually not the document, would all explain to me. The actual EPA is just a series of numbers that nobody could make sense of. This is the briefing derived from those numbers. So John Lehman wanted to have a large Navy, a 600 ship Navy, and the EPA was going to figure out, well, can we actually afford this large Navy? What they realized was, you remember that palm I told you about, that five-year plan? No palm ever has been implemented as planned. The five-year plan is actually not a plan. It's really just a sort of suggested guidelines that we never actually fulfill. Why do we never fulfill the palm? Because a, a large percentage of procurement is deferred or not realized. That's a fancy way of saying we bury the cost uh, later in the budget and hope to God that somebody makes up Congress will make up the shortfall. There's procurement cost growth, which I'll explain, mainly due to complexity. There's the ops tempo. If there's a war, things are going to cost more. Or we're going to use up our assets faster than we had expected. And there's the budget process itself. Just because you were assuming that we're going to have certain amounts of budget growth in the future doesn't mean Congress is actually going to give you the money. Because you don't control Congress, Congress controls Congress. All right. Some, some basic sort of, you know, uh, guidelines. Here's the historical trend of what's known as total obligatory authority. And I don't really want to explain what total obligatory authority means. Let's just assume it's a synonym for the amount of money DOD can spend. This is the historical trend of, of what the TOA had looked like since the 1960s. And here's what Palm 84 assumed would occur in future. Doesn't seem like it's, 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 it's there with historical trends. But maybe Reagan has changed politics forever. Here's trends in procurement. Procurement's a DOD has a term. They use the term acquisition. Congress uses the term procurement. Buying stuff is all you need to know. Here's what we have been spending on procurement in the 70s. Here's what we assumed we'd be spending in future. A bit of a gap in terms of uh, what the future looked like based on past projections. Readiness. Readiness is basically how do we maintain the forces that we have so they can actually do their job? Like, ships have fuel, you know, planes have ammunition, uh, guns have, you know, missiles, ammunition, whatever. This is a historical trend. This is what we assumed we'd have in future. Major increase that was totally at odds with historical experience. And, of course, there's the realities of procurement planning. And I'm sorry to have to get into this, but it's so interesting to me. I just feel like I have to share this with you. Remember that five-year plan, right? So you'd assume that well, if there's a five-year plan, 20% of the, you know, each year is 20% of the plan, right? Actually, no. What's increasingly happening is that you're pushing more and more of that stuff into the last, <coughs> into the end of the palm. Mm -hmm. So rather than uh, buying 20% every year, you might build 15% the first, you know, few years, and then 25 or 30% later on. And so you can see the amount of material that is bought in the last two years of the palm is increasing over time. And why was that happening? Because programmers were hoping that, that Congress would raise the budget in future so that you could afford to buy more in future because, the, because uh, the budget got up. But if the budget doesn't go up, you can't fulfill the palm. And of course, there's the idea of cost, uh, uh, cost growth. And this is the most important factor that the EPA guys pointed out. And what's cost growth? Cost growth is, I think it's going to cost this much, and this is how much it actually costs. What do you think the gap is between those two? Anyone want to guess? That, okay, that, okay, then you're really doing a bad job. And, and, and my friend who ran the Navy's cost analysis job would feel very sad that you said that. But what they traditionally find is, even within established programs, there was roughly 6 to 7% cost growth every single year. And why is that? And, and specifically, it comes up like, I'm sorry, the slides are, are not very good, but it includes there's, there's 
uh, cost growth for weapons and planes, there's cost growth for ships, uh, there's fuel costs, there's labor costs, there's all these things. But roughly all you need to know is it's, it's going to increase roughly 6 to 7% every year. Uh, it's actually going to be, uh, it's going to be roughly 6% every year, and this is the key slide here. To maintain the existing force levels, not to build up to 600 ships, to maintain even the 500 ships that we, that we had at that time, if you include a cost risk, you needed roughly 7% real growth in the budget every year. 7% growth every year just to stand still, not to build up to 600 ships, not to sort of, you know, uh, take advantage of all these new technologies that uh, the revivalists talked about. Just to stand still, you needed to have 7% growth, mainly because of technological complexity. And then, even if you did that, you'd still have the problem that all the stuff that you were spending this money on would then eventually become obsolete and have to be uh, replaced. So what do these guys point out? All the, sh all the platforms, the mature platforms that, you know, that Lehman was, was, was leveraging, yes, they were good now, but around the year 2000, they would all go out of date. The F-14 fighter, uh, the Los Angeles-class submarine, the A-6 intruder fighter bomber, all this stuff, and then you'd have this, what was known as the block obsolescence problem. This is why the Navy cratered in the 70s, not because of Jimmy Carter's perfidity, just because all the stuff that had been, in, been built in World War II last 30 years, 30 years after 1945 equals 1975. Everything goes out of date. And what do you know? Around the year 2000, the size of the Navy craters because all this stuff becomes out of date and the new stuff is much more expensive. So the EPA guys have a series of ideas. It's like, how do we actually deal with this? Like, be tough on contractors and like, here's things you can do. But their fundamental point is that cost growth is not a bug, it's a feature of the system. And even great management, even great leadership by a guy named John, like John Lehman is not going to be enough. And they worry that unless you do something about cost growth, a, sh a fleet of 450 to 500 ships may be the upper limit of what is possible even with the Reagan budget increase. So, is, is CVBG carrier battle group? Yes. Sorry, I'm sorry about that acronyms. Even the, D, even the DOD guys don't know what they all mean. So don't, don't <laughs> let them fool you. Okay. Now, why did they actually say this? And this is a point that I actually went to Woodall and I said to him, like, Woodall, just to give you an idea, Woodall said to me once, I spent my entire life training to kill Soviets. And if war had come, I would have been really good at it. And I said, well, if you were... And, and he also told me, I really love the maritime strategy. I was thought it was a great idea to go into their backyard, kick their butts. And I said, well, how could you do this analysis and support the maritime strategy? He said, Anand, you don't realize. We weren't telling Lehman this because we wanted to kill the maritime strategy. We wanted him to save the maritime strategy, which meant that he needed to understand the money he was getting was not enough. He needed to ask for more money. Just think to yourself, you've already had the largest peacetime budget increases in history, and your own guys are telling you it's not enough. And what's more is, they're telling you, and the line is actually in the document. Once I actually, once I actually, once I actually saw this, I saw, uh, I saw what you said. The purpose of this is a presentation of the Palm shortfall and others in order to bring about a reprioritization of the, of the DOD budget, which in other words means the Navy's solution was we need to take away money from the Army and the Air Force in order to make this thing possible. So what does Lehman do? He fires all these guys and closes the office. <laughs> and there's a point of view, there's, nice. there's a point of view that Lehman did this because Lehman was hostile to analysis that contradicted his political beliefs. And I think that is true to a certain extent, but contradicting your political beliefs doesn't mean that those politics are unimportant. If something is not politically feasible, it's not good policy. Why did Lehman reject what the EPA guys were telling me? Fundamentally, Lehman's, Lehman believed that past performance was not indicative of future performance, that through the acquisition reforms I talked about, fixed price contracts, ending gold plating, 
pushing costs onto contractors, he'd be able to co keep cost growth at roughly 3% a year, and as long as the budget increased by 3% a year, you'd be able to maintain the 600 ship Navy. There's another reason why I think he didn't, uh, he didn't actually make the case as he should have, and that's because of these other guys. Jack Marsh, Secretary of the Army, Vern Orr, Secretary of the Air Force, and of course, Casper uh, Weinberger. You could not go to the other services and make a claim that we need to take money away from you to spend on the Navy. There's been a lot of attention on what the Navy has been doing in the Cold War, mainly because of John Lehman and others, to the point where we actually don't have a, as good an understanding of what the Air Force and the Army were doing at this time. But they also had their own complex, extensive ideas for how they're going to confront the Soviet Union. Air land battle, um, battlefield air introduction, which is sort of dumbed down version of assault breaker, uh, which had been pioneered by, again, history's greatest monster, Jimmy Carter. Um, they had their own ideas about what they were doing, and they were not willing to see those strategies given up simply so the Navy could have more ships. So ultimately, uh, the point I'm going to make is here is that at all times, political and resource constraints guided Lehman's actions as much as his strategic preferences. And I'm going to close with a quote by uh, the head of uh, Navy cost, cost analysis. Cost analysis is basically a fancy way of saying how much do things actually cost, which is in DOD much harder than you might imagine. Uh, and he wrote this thing to a guy named Wayne Hughes. Any of you seen The Hunt for Red October? In the very beginning of the book, you see Jack Ryan's library. There are two books. There's one book on Civil War naval operations by a colleague of mine, Craig Simons. And the other book is Fleet Tactics by Wayne Hughes. He is the godfather of Navy tactics. So these are two very serious hitters. Nussbaum writes to Hughes in th uh, 13th August 2018, policy trumps analysis. Specifically, your analysis can be analytically unimpeachable, and it can point to course of action A. But if the decision maker chooses course of action B, you should not, capitalized, assume it is ignorance or venality on his or her part. It is a result of their equities, which you, the analyst, probably don't know fully. Be happy to play your part in the larger decision processes of issues that are important to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I promise we'll open up to questions. I wanted to take 45 seconds just to say one thing I liked about each uh, presentation. Uh, for, for, and it's a part of it based on my own work on the foreign relations series. I was very, I also think there was a natural arc trajectory to this conversation, starting with uh, James Schlesinger's talk about how bureaucratic policy informs a number of these strategic debates culminating uh, in the 1980s. Uh, in terms of the, what I really like, one thing I one thing I really liked about Kyle's presentation is that I find so much uh, in working on documenting the uh, strategic arms uh, uh, reduction treaty that the air launch cruise missiles on B-52s, which are a particular threat to Soviet uh, air defenses, really become key to this agreement. It's something to trade off against. Uh, Soviet SS-18s, and it's a relatively obscure program, but it doesn't get much attention, but it really comes out of a number of, of the ideas uh, that Kyle is talking about. Uh, in Nick's paper, uh, it really gets at the human element of the Reagan, uh, what we think of as the Reagan arms buildup, and you, one hears this a lot from a number of people who were involved in or, or active service members in the 1980s uh, talking about this. And, you know, the idea if you're a pilot, you can leave for commercial aviation. You don't want to, but, you know, you have to afford for your family. Uh, and I also like the contrast between the personalities of how you draw out the contrast of uh, personalities of Reagan and Jimmy Carter that are not always necessarily based on an ideological divide. I mean, we spend so much time if you look through the handwriting that Reagan uh, or Carter, the, how they work up NSC memos, you see Jimmy Carter saying, writing, get back to me on this. I need to make that decision. And you think, come on, man, you know. And, you know, Reagan's is different. It's just, that sounds great, you know, that sounds great. Um, 
uh, and with Anand, I think it's fascinating how you use this 600 ship model to illuminate the complexities of strategic planning and showing the contingencies of the so-called Reagan arms buildup. There's the unpredictability of the financial, the fiscal environment, the structural limitations of the hardware. And I would be interested at, at some point, how, you know, how you think about the, the, the tail end of the five, these five-year plans and how it coincides with um, the Graham-Rudman Deficit Reduction Act, which really hovers all over all, all of the, the last three years, two or three years of the Reagan administration, this idea that you're going to face automatic sequesters, sequesters based on a projected uh, projections of the federal deficit, and you know how do you how do you do strategic planning in that environment? Okay, now I will back off and open it up for questions. Yes, Ben, please. So uh, one of the things we talked about a lot, I guess, was this idea of understanding their side and their group. So I think you know, Kyle, when you brought up this idea of the Soviets not being you know ten foot tall. Uh, yet there's still, I think, this angst, right, that you bring up, David, about the Soviet Navy is now larger than the American one in 1978, and we need a 600-ship Navy in order to uh, combat this great Soviet naval power. And yet, when I think about Soviet or Russian Navy, the next word usually is disaster, right? <laughs> so how how do the actual, like, Russian and Soviet capabilities influence what I'm bringing up here? Um, so... Uh, with in terms of Schlesinger and Fred Ickel, especially um, in the 1980s when Ickel joins the Reagan administration, um, they saw um, though they publicly espoused um, the Soviet threat, um, they were they were privately critical of people like Nitsa um, for kind of uh, portraying this image of a uh, massive threat. And they actually thought that this underplayed, hid Soviet vulnerabilities. Like you're talking about uh, Schlesinger, though he didn't get into it with the Soviet Navy. In the 1975, uh, 1974, 1975, he thought the Soviet Navy was essentially um, a Coast Guard. Um, it was not a Blue Wire Navy, although in the 1970s, Gorshkov was trying to you know, uh, build one. Um, but essentially, it was just a show-the-flag Navy. So people like Schlesinger and Marshall, to answer your question, um, though they were aligned with NHTSA, um, they were kind of critical of NHTSA for kind of inflating this image of the Soviet threat. They, they saw clear weaknesses in the Soviet Navy. Soviet bomber force, um, the Russian Air Force obviously still can't operate in Ukraine. So things like that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm just, I would just... Again, if I had more time, I would have gone into some of this. Uh, and, and the key figure, actually, is, guy, is Manthorpe, because he's, he's the guy who's studying the Soviet Navy. So I think it's worth bearing in, bearing in mind, um, I have a confession to make. I'm obsessed with Andrew Marshall in that assessment, like, probably a little unhealthy. <laughs> um, Marshall's big, and, and you forgive me if I'm just repeating you know, uh, points that my, my colleagues would know, um, Marshall despise more than anything else lazy analysis and the laziest form of analysis is what he called bean counting they have this many beans we have this many beans if they have more beans than us they win i don't know whatever uh a lot of the soviet the soviet naval buildup was really just bean counting and it was the worst kind of bean counting because it was the soviets built a lot of ships but according to the numbers that people like Elmo Zumwalt, whom I admire in many respects, but I find this to be very disingenuous in other respects, Zumwalt focused on the number of ships the Soviets built. Uh, Marshall actually writes a scathing analysis, which I actually found by accident on the DOD FOIA website of all places. And it was unmarked. I don't even know how I found it. It was just pure luck. He pointed out, yes, the Soviets are building more ships than us because we're, because we're counting their destroyers as equivalent to our carriers. If we count tonnage, even during the Vietnam War, at the end of the Vietnam War, when the Navy is getting hammered and the Soviets are doing a massive buildup, we are building in terms of tonnage 50% more than the Soviet Union. The moment you use a different metric, the entire Soviet buildup evaporates. And that's why I think a lot of the stuff about the Soviet military threat is, you know, targeting back to what 
Professor Fisher had said you know, yesterday, a lot of it is really just smoke and mirrors. And the moment you use a different frame of analysis, it kind of disappears. And Manthorpe's key uh, insight was, we don't measure, we don't count, sh net assessment isn't about counting how much stuff both sides have. It's about understanding the interaction. If you want to do an assessment of the Soviet and American Navy, we don't just count, well, they have this many carriers, and we have this many carriers, and therefore our Navy is better than their Navy. The Soviets weren't building the, an equivalent to the U.S. Navy. They were building an alternative to the U.S. Navy. They were putting their resources in different aspects. So the way you understood the competition, the assessment between these two sides, was to count their submarines, which, which was the bulk of their Navy, against our anti-submarine warfare, to, con to, to contrast their Soviet naval aviation firing you know, anti-ship missiles against our anti-air anti -air warfare systems. You have, to, you have to contrast systems against one another, not just numbers. And what he found was, and this was just before the EPA analysis, this is one of the reasons why Lehman shuts down the office, he pointed out that the Soviet Navy was not the Navy we thought it was. It was designed primarily for defensive missions and relying heavily on submarines. And if we wanted to counter that Navy, we needed to actually build uh, more anti-submarine warfare capable ships and fewer carriers. This is not what John Lehman wanted to hear. But Manthorpe, like Woodall, have the conceit of the analyst. They assume that our analysis is impe unimpeachable. And if you don't buy it, it's because you're either a knave or a fool. What both Manthorpe and Woodall told me afterwards was we didn't actually realize what Lehman was doing, and if we could have done it over again, we would have done things very differently. Manthorpe wrote to me, if I had known, I would have given him a brief with extracts of the net assessment that he would have loved and asked for more. Later, he could have been briefed on issues, on the issues that were less interesting to him as needed to convince him on the importance of other issues, platforms, etc., to gain his support. Ultimately, what these analysts did was they thought the analysis would speak for itself, and because the analysis contradicted prevailing political norms or constraints, Lehman was free to reject it, and they felt that was because Lehman was being disingenuous. Rather, it was, in a sense, a failure of the analysts to understand that they were not offering politically useful advice, and both of and both Woodall and Manthorpe, uh, who, I, who I've interviewed and I'm friends with, have admitted again they would have done things differently, like presenting, like like you, like as the question was originally tied us all back related to the Soviet Navy, understanding what the Soviet Navy was, actually was, as opposed to what we thought it was, is you know was a little bit more complex than uh, than people let on. Nick, did you want to jump in? <clears throat> Well, I'll just say very quickly, I think it's just we're seeing the power of perception, right? Uh, at least, you know, if um, classifying this as a human interest uh, segment. But uh, th that perception was strong. But off the top of my head, there was only one veteran. It was Mark Nesselrode who flat out said, capability-wise, he wasn't confident as an anti-surface warfare that um, they could counteract these Soviet planes. Everyone else was inferring or straight out saying it was the culture at the time. They weren't confident in their ability to act as a unit to sail or to even get out to sea, as I referenced in there. So um, I was purposely using confidence and faith a lot because they talk about how these things were just building up. And within the retention of recruits, it's when they were getting high school dropouts, you know, people, hey, you can get out of jail if you want to come in. Because no one in the right mind wanted to serve. Why be locked into a four-year pay ceiling that's just going to make me more poor, to be honest, while I see my friends thrive? So we weren't getting people coming in there with the best intentions. They were just trying to get out of trouble. So that all contributed, and then unsolicited, every single one of them talked about Operation Eagle Claw. Like, that was, that was it. They felt like they hit a low point as a military. It was a gut punch. Those are all verbatim phrases they used. And uh, I remember one guy saying straight up, like, we were ready to turn the page on Carter because it just was not good. <laughs> so, but again, power of perception, right? We talked about the investments and all the stuff that uh, Carter at least started that Reagan was able to pick up on. But that's not trickling down, right? So, you know, the people that are serving, they're, they're not informed on that. They only see and feel what's day-to-day. -day. And that's equally important if you want to have an all-volunteer force that's credible. We have time for one or two quest last questions. Yeah. Luke, go ahead. For Kyle, um, I think that the Reagan administration adopted military programs that were specifically 
So, could you elaborate on one zero? Yeah, so uh, in my larger paper, I kind of uh, added some nuance to this. So, um, I kind of alluded to in my opening anecdote, Reagan's sense of this was largely intuitive. Uh, Weinberger, for instance, just wanted to build up to build up with this vague sense. Um, Weinberger, in fact, did not believe that the Soviet economy was as weak as Reagan thought it was, as Rowan thought it was. Um, so down at the second level there, though, with Ickle um, being informed by these Marshall's net assessments, um, Ickle is um, programming these forces. Um, he's planning these forces to be postured for things like discriminant um, nuclear warfare with the sense that this is going to impose costs. So it's, it's complicated here. Uh, Weinberger's just building up because he sees the Soviets as NHTSA saw them. Um, so yeah, things like Ickle, but specific programs, um, Schlesinger um, originally programmed the cruise missile as a cost imposing for reasons more than just uh, if we fell into a nuclear war as a peacetime cost imposition instrument. And so in effect, I think that's what occurred in the 80s, whether or not someone like Weinberger was programmed this in, in practice, this is what occurred, whether or not Weinberger uh, uh, thought so is unlikely because he saw the Soviets as strong economically and militarily. Well, with that, let's uh, thank our panelists for a wonderful presentation.